Welcome to part two of this presentation of the, from the annual stakeholders meeting of the Dennis Hurley Centre from February 2020. It looked through the lens of the book of Genesis at the roots of who we are and what feeds us. The book of Exodus, how we have not been afraid to head out into new territory as an organisation. With the third book of Moses, the book of Leviticus, and the principles that lie behind what we do. And I want to look at our principles in particular in relation to two projects that have taken up a lot of our time in 2019 and the key principles that we have of civic participation and economic participation. Civic participation is exemplified by our role in the South African general election which took place in May 2019. Dennis Hurley and Paddy Carney were great champions for democracy in South Africa and the extension of the vote to all el eligible adults. And so it's fitting that the Dennis Hurley Centre was established as a voting station for the elections in 2019. And you see here a queue of people waiting patiently in the sunshine outside the Dennis Hurley Centre, ready to go in and cast their votes. In preparing for that, we realised that there were many people, many homeless people, who were entitled to vote but were not registered to vote. And indeed in many cases had never registered to vote. And therefore, even though we've had democracy in South Africa for 25 years, they had not benefited from that transformation. So we worked closely with the Independent Electoral Commission to ensure that as many as possible of these eligible homeless people were indeed registered to vote. The IEC were incredibly supportive and cooperative. We struggled a bit more with the Department of Home Affairs uh, for their cooperation because in many cases we needed to get replacement IDs for a number of the homeless people and sadly that wasn't possible in the time for everyone and we continue to work closely with the Department of Home Affairs to replace IDs for homeless people. The events of registering for people to vote were ones that we made sure were fun as well as as well as serious. It's much easier to engage people if there's something uh, attractive with music or dance to bring them to the building and uh, and then talk to them about something which initially looks a little off putting about politics or voting. And it was important that once people were registered to vote, that they had time to think about who they were voting for and what voting was all about. So we organised workshops with DDP, the uh, Democracy Development Programme, and young law students from the University of KwaZulu-Natal to talk to homeless people and help them think about what political issues they faced and what role the political parties played in responding to those issues. And then a few weeks before the election, we had an opportunity for homeless people to come face to face with the political parties themselves. In an event called I Count, uh, we wanted homeless people to be able to listen to politicians, but also to pose questions of the politicians and see whether they answered them or not. And I'm pleased to say that the pol political representatives that came from the four leading parties in KZN were very senior members of their parties and were not afraid to engage with the homeless and indeed treat them as the citizens that they are. All of this culminated in the moment of grace on the 8th of May, where uh, 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 hundreds of homeless people and ordinary regular residents queued up side by side, waiting to take their turn to vote in the IEC run elections. It was a very moving moment and one that we know Paddy Carney would have longed to have seen had he still been with us. Economic participation is something that we continue to work at and sometimes struggle with. So many homeless people are on the streets because they lack work and they lack the opportunity to work. And that's particularly the case in Durban, which has very high rates of youth unemployment. So we've constantly been looking for ways in which we can give homeless people a chance to make a living for themselves. And our most successful programme has been the Street Lit programme, where homeless people are selling second-hand books on the streets. We enter the project into a national competition run by the South African Breweries Foundation and came first in KZN and sixth nationally 
uh, and as a result of that, get a substantial grant from SAB, but also business mentoring for the project so that we can develop it and expand it. This is so important because homeless people really do want to work. They have ended up on the streets because they can't find work. And in answer to the question in the survey we did with the Human Science Research Council a few years ago, the, the vast majority of them said that work is what would get them off the streets. Not accommodation, not money, but work. And we've gone through a number of different options. We've tried car washing, we've tried uh, teams of people doing manual labour, we tried the traditional route of homeless people selling newspapers on the streets, working closely with our friends at independent newspapers who produced the Mercury and the Daily News. And this project, Paper Money, certainly gained very good visibility for the homeless. Sadly, they weren't making enough money selling the papers uh, uh, on street corners. But it was because of that that Anivesh Singh, seen here on the right, a local publisher, approached us and said, well, have you thought about the guys selling books as well as newspapers? And from that random idea has developed the Streetlit program in which we now have over a dozen uh, young men and women who are kitted out in lovely uniforms selling really quality around the city. And one of the reasons they succeed at that is because there is a great thirst for people to buy books. In an astonishing statistic, we discovered that 60% of South African households, that's three out of every five households, there is no book at home other than the Bible. But it's hardly surprising when just a simple paperback costs the equivalent of a day and a half's wages for the average South African. So clearly people are unlikely to buy books when they're so expensive. Ironically, though, there is a massive supply of good books available, and we've discovered since we started this project, we have an almost unlimited supply of really quality books, here some being donated by St. Henry's School, but very often the books are actually coming from older people living in big houses who are scaling down to smaller residences or retirement villages and can't take their libraries with them. They don't want those books to be pulped, and they're happy to donate us donate them to us, knowing that they'll go back into circulation, that they'll be read by other people, and that they'll be helping homeless people on the way. In fact, sometimes we're too successful. The number of books that come in uh, sometimes swamps us. And we were in the course of the year, St. John's, uh, who have a large building in the center of the CBD, uh, have given us a very uh, wonderful space to use as a storeroom where we can sort books when they come in and uh, divide them into categories and into authors to make it much easier to find books and indeed to deliver books to some customers on demand when they, there's a particular book that they're looking for. So our project is one in which we are connecting supply and demand and the street booksellers, the street lit entrepreneurs are able to be in places where people want to buy with product they want to buy and selling them at five or 10 or 20 rand a piece, a very affordable price for an excellent quality book. So we decided to take this project into the national SAB competition, which was held in Johannesburg. And our team were not just the director and Stuart Talbot seen here, the originator of the project, but two of the booksellers themselves, Richard and Zima on the left and Pat Kumalo on the right. And in fact, we set them up with trolleys. They sold books to the other contestants. They sold books to the judges and their personal stories about how they had ended up on the streets and how the bookselling had transformed their lives was really uh, breathtakingly powerful in persuading people of the merit of this project. So we keep knocking at doors, looking for more and more places to sell. Uh, over the holiday season, around December and January, we had booksellers on the beachfront for the first time. And indeed, over the two weeks of the festive season, uh, four booksellers sold a thousand books with a value of 20,000 rand in just two weeks. And in their distinctive new uniforms donated by Johnson's Workwear and with the St. John's Ambulance umbrella making them very, very visible. And indeed, they'd all been trained in first aid so they could also act as first responders should any accidents happen on the beach. The power of this project and an important principle that we work by is the power of partnership. 
We couldn't do the Street Lit program without all the churches that help us collect books, all the individuals who donate books, the different venues who enable us to sell, and the, and the co collaboration of the municipality who gave us permission to sell on the beachfront, and on the right-hand side, the COO of Tsogo San Hotels, who provided us with storage space for the, for the book trolleys during the course of the festive season. Let's move on to the fourth book of Moses, the book of Numbers. Of course, it's not just about numbers, but numbers do matter. Let's pause and look at some important numbers in our work. Looking at the clinic, you'll see that we saw almost 30,000 patients in 2019. That was up 11% on the previous year. That's the equivalent to 124 consultations for each working day. At the main clinic in the Dennis Hurley Center, seen here, Almost half of the people we saw were refugees or foreign nationals, and about a third of them aged under 21. The number of patients also includes the patients that we see on the streets with our mobile clinic. And seen here are some of the beneficiaries of that mobile clinic talking about the power and the value of the service we provide. On the right hand side is Ruth Bertwistle, the coordinator of the clinic project who, as you may notice from the photograph, was pregnant last year. She gave birth to a beautiful baby daughter, Lily, in December, and is now back at work and has been leading our response to the COVID pandemic in, on the streets of Durban. And the third site where our clinic works is our converted container at Dalton. At all of our sites in the Hurley Center and the mobile clinic and at the Dalton uh, satellite clinic, we conduct HIV tests. And we conducted over 2,000 last year. On average, about 20% of the women that we test are HIV positive and about 12% of the men. And the HIV tests are possible because of the support of the US government and the South African government, who then follow up by enabling us to start people on antiretroviral medications. So when you add all that up, that means that we've seen 141,000 patients over the last five years. But what's remarkable is the cost efficiency with which we do so. So in 2019, each patient that we saw cost the equivalent of only 62 Rand. That's for staffing, medicines, and all the other costs of running a clinic, less than three pounds for each patient that we saw. But if we're, since we're seeing so many each year, that does mean we need to raise 1.8 million each year just to keep our clinic going. Another area of our work which involves big numbers is our feeding program in Cosinati. We didn't quite match our total of 100,000 meals from 2018, but we got very close. 45,000 breakfasts and 43,000 lunches. And of course, those are freshly cooked lunches a pup and stew or curry and rice. We're not running a soup kitchen. We're running an excellent, really high quality uh, um, lunch distribution service. The Incosinati project is critical, not just in feeding people, but in connecting with people in need. It means that they will come in and come in regularly. And because they get to know us and we get to know them, we build trust with them and they begin to tell us their stories and allow us to help them in more ways. It's also important as a way of giving people an opportunity to help and to volunteer. And one of the striking things about Incosinati is the number of volunteering sessions that we had, almost 2,000 in 2019. As you see, a huge financial value to the organization, effectively of free labor. Here, the volunteers are young people from Holy Family College, we have volunteers from almost all of the private schools in central Durban, from universities, from synagogues, mosques, churches, and from different corporate organizations as well. But we also have volunteers who are homeless, between 20 and 25% of them. And that's really important because it means when people come in to volunteer, they find themselves shoulder to shoulder with homeless people and after a while forget who's homeless and who's not homeless and they're busy chopping vegetables and chatting to each other about their lives and their experience of being in Durban. 
Our showers are also a big number. 10,000 showers um, were used during 2019. That number is down on the previous year because for a long period our showers were out of commission and indeed they've only just been uh, renovated at substantial cost and we hope will then be more reliable and easier to clean going forwards. And then the financial numbers. Well, it's important to see that we're holding our budget steady. You'll see from this chart that between 2016, 17 and 18, our expenses increased. But since 2018, they've held steady and our budget is to continue to hold them steady into 2020. This is important because funding is not guaranteed for us. And so managing our expenses, even though this includes uh, inflationary or above inflationary uh, salary adjustments for staff, uh, we are able to work more and more efficiently to deliver the same or more, but at, uh, at, uh, at the same cost. That total cost, as you see, is under 5 million rand a year. So that's the equivalent of less than a quarter of a million pounds uh, a year for all the work that we do. Where does that money go? Well, not surprisingly, uh, uh, over 60% is spent on salaries for staff. But again, if you look at the number of staff, the equivalent of 20 full-time equivalent at 2.8 million on staffing, that's the equivalent of just over 500 pounds per staff member per month. Hardly, hardly an expensive uh, uh, cost. And then all the other costs, the ones you would expect of supplies and utilities, uh, running our mobile, our mobile clinic, printing, accounting, security, and so on and so forth. All the costs you would expect from running any kind of building or set of projects. And all of these are meticulous, meticulously managed uh, by our excellent team, a financial team, our finance manager, our administrator, and also the financial committee of the trust. And those expenses are funded from a very wide range of donors. And we intentionally keep our donors, uh, our, our range of donors wide so that we're not overly dependent on any one aspect of donations. Uh, you'll see here that almost 40% of our funding in 2019 came from overseas. That, in fact, was an increase on the previous year, in particular because of some substantial uh, government grants that we received from overseas governments in 2019. Uh, but included within the overseas individuals and activities would be the fundraising by the Dennis Hurley Association and also from our equivalent organization in the United States. From our funding in South Africa, as well as different donors uh, in Durban and other parts of South Africa, we also raise money from tenants who use the building, obviously from interest. There was a rollover of money from 2018. Fundraising activities is not quite 0%, it, it, but it's very small. Um, but the importance of fundraising activities is less about the money they bring in and more about the visibility of the concerts and the events and the ways that they build community. So finally, the last book of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, when the Israelites reached the promised land. Well, we're not quite at the promised land, but we're heading in that direction. We've certainly headed in that direction with our role in the Etiquini Task Team, a group which brings together NGOs, corporates, academics and government officials to look together at how we can respond to the challenge of homelessness. And a member of that group is Bongani Madida, seen here, who is no longer standing outside City Hall waiting to, be, to get in, but is sitting inside the room with the deputy mayor and other officials and representing the voice of homeless people inside City Hall. One of the initiatives that the task team has been progressing is one modelled on something that's been successful in Cape Town, to have a safe open space where homeless people can sleep to be sheltered from the elements, but also safe from each other and safe from the police. And as a result of the work of the task team, two if not three of those SOSs will be opening and also opening in 2020, finally, a building funded by the municipality to ensure that women and children are not on the streets of Durban, but do have a choice. They, of course, are particularly vulnerable and should not be sleeping on the streets. And this building had been empty for a number of years, and we finally persuaded the municipality to commit to turning it into a, sh into a shelter for homeless women and children. 
And in doing so, we've looked at other shelters around the country and have been impressed at the quality of those shelters and seen that when you have high expectations of what a shelter can be, you then uh, raise the expectations of the homeless people themselves and their behavior. If, if much is expected of them and much is offered to them, they respond in a positive way. So that we visited in Bloemfontein looks more like a boutique hotel or a home than a homeless shelter. Part of these visits are a benefit of being part now of the National Homeless Network, which meets together physically once a year, but also meets together virtually more regularly to share ideas and to share initiatives around the country. We are working with government, but it's also important that we can still challenge government and hold them to account. And that's something which is a particular problem in Durban when often government and particularly the police are, uh, are sent to abuse the, the rights of homeless people living on the streets by beating them up and stealing their belongings. So we continue to work with the law faculty at the university and now with the Navi, Navi Pile Research Institute. Navi Pile, seen here, was the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner, a very, very uh, uh, exalted and, and well-known international jurist. She's now retired and come back to Durban and has taken up homelessness as one of the issues that she wants to look at in co collaboration with the National Human Rights Commission. We're looking forward to more fun stuff in the building, more films, more dance, more music, more of the arts that make our lives so enjoyable and ensure that we live up to the motto on our foundation stone that we, we follow Jesus' words to bring life to the full. There are likely to be changes in our cafe operations in 2020, so not quite the promised land yet. La land yet. Our deaf students who have been studying in the cafe are moving on to a new kind of project. And so we're looking at ways in which we can continue to operate the cafe using some of the people who've qualified on that. And as I mentioned, we're planning a big expansion of the Streetlit program thanks to the SAB money. But to look at what we can learn from Streetlit and also Street Store, our annual event to distribute secondhand clothes, and see that there is a big market in connecting goods that people have or would otherwise throw away with the desire of people, uh, poorer people, to buy those and to, uh, and to reuse them. And we've been inspired by a model we've seen in Cape Town and, of course, very common in the UK of, of well-run shops which are selling second-hand goods uh, in the same format as if they were selling new goods. The great success of the Cape Town model is that the shops are run by homeless people themselves and the money that they make running the shops uh, goes straight to the homeless people. And that's one of a number of initiatives we're looking at as part of a collab uh, on economic development projects with two of the business schools in South Africa to see how we can work with them to develop new ideas. But obviously to do all this we need money. And one of the striking things is that though our expenses have stayed steady over the last few years, our income is actually dropping. And it's dropping because each year we raise about the same amount of money, but there's less funding to roll over from the previous year. And in fact, our budget for 2020 anticipates a, a deficit unless we can increase our fundraising in 2020. So it's a constant challenge to us to continue to raise funds from existing sources and that's particularly the case when some expenses are going to increase. For example, repairs and maintenance in the building are bound to go up as the building becomes older. One of the particular initiatives that we've started now for our fundraising is a legacy fund. Paddy Carney was very keen on this and indeed left a substantial amount in his will to enable us to start the legacy fund. And we've launched it in 2019, named in his honor and encouraging people to make a, uh, um, an allowance in their will to leave uh, a fixed amount of money or a proportion of their assets to the Dennis Hurley Center. And our commitment is that that money will not be spent but instead invested and it is the, only the interest from the money that we'll be spending. So that means that money left uh, as, a, as a legacy to the Dennis Hurley Center will continue to benefit the Hurley Center for many years to come. And that can also be done for UK residents leaving money in their wills to the Dennis Hurley Association, which can be bound by the same terms. 
but also looking again at some of our previous funders, looking at new funders, and we believe that we, we're an attractive destination for funders. We're very efficient, we've got excellent financial controls, and we certainly deliver results. And finally, one of the reasons we are able to deliver results is because we don't work on our own. We work constantly in partnership with other people. And you see here a list of just some of the many, many partners that we work with. Faith partners, of course, in the Catholic community, the wider Christian community and the wider faith communities. Partners from the world of the arts, education, NGOs, the media, government partners at different levels, and an increasingly long list of corporate partners, as well as overseas partners, such as the Dennis Hurley Association, the Archdiocese of Birmingham, and other groups around the world. So if you are a partner of ours, if you're helping us through fundraising, through working with us, if you are supporting us uh, as a volunteer or supporting us with your prayers, thank you for your partnership. Thank you, thank you for your collaboration. We couldn't do the work we do without you. And we ask God to bless you for all you have done and all you will continue to do. Thank you.